Picture this. You sit down with your friends or your family one day and decide to watch an anime. You're all having a great time and you're so happy that you were finally able to convince them to give anime a chance after reassuring them it's not weird. And then suddenly... Admit it, we've all been there before. It really sucks when a perfectly good scene gets interrupted by the most well-animated sequence of boobs bouncing you've ever seen in your life. Like, I'm talking all the budget went into this and... Wait a second, is... is that fucking CGI? Uh, what were we talking about again? Oh yeah, fan service. If you're an anime fan, you likely have come across fan service in some capacity as it's a staple part of the medium. In technicality, fan service exists in every medium as all the term means is servicing the fan, or to put more simply, showing the fans something they want to see, like Captain America wielding Thor's hammer. But when referring to anime, the term is synonymous with sexually gratuitous material. Stuff to beat your me too, basically. As anime characters tend to be intentionally attractive by design, most people, at least within the Japanese consumer base, want to indulge in their attractiveness. This has led to fanservice being utilized within a good amount of properties, ranging from a minimal inclusion of it to straight up revolving around fanservice, like the ecchi genre. Even outside of the medium, merchandising like body pillows, lewd figures that I totally don't own, and even onaholes, look it up for yourself, are pumped out like hotcakes. While it's clearly proven to be a success for the Japanese side of anime fandom, the same can't entirely be said about the Western audience. Fan service has been one of the most contentious topics within the community for as long as I can remember, with the scale leaning more and more towards it being considered a detriment with each passing year. Basically, everyone is admitting that they're afraid of tits. And seeing as you clicked on this video, I'm sure you're able to guess that I have a more positive view of fan service. Lots of my favorite series contain loads of it, and it's been a natural part of the medium from the moment I began watching anime as a snot-nosed 12 year old with things like Future Diary and Sword Art Online. Which, fun fact, is where I got the name Kikazu from. I'm basically Kirito IRL, I mean. <laughs> Oh, I'm a fucking loser. I've also been very open about the fact that I'm a fan of Echi, with things like Mato Sehi no Slave, Ayakashi Triangle, and Gushing Over Magical Girls being among some of my favorite manga. I feel that fanservice allows for the most absurd premises, particularly within Echi, of course, and to me, the absurd is extremely enjoyable. Unironically, I am someone who enjoys these kinds of series for the plot, and don't just say it as a meme, though I am a degenerate who likes the fanservice too, don't get me wrong. But I personally think fanservice has evolved in an intriguing way, as it can now serve a purpose beyond convincing lonely anime fans, such as myself, to buy sexy anime girl merchandise and serve as the baseline for an entire narrative, as seen in something like Kill a Kill and Punchline. That isn't to say that I think fanservice with no meaning is the worst thing ever, as I typically never get offended by the mere existence of it like a very large chunk of the community does. Unless it's done egregiously bad, of course. And despite what the title of this video might claim, I don't think anyone is wrong for disliking fanservice, believe me. Certain things just aren't for everyone, and being into a medium doesn't mean you have to like every quality it possesses. As massive of a horror movie fan I am, I will never watch things like Terrifier 2 or Martyrs, as I'm a squeamish little bitch who can't handle torture porn. The same can't be said for anime fans though, as they seemingly engage with things they know they'll dislike, and then complain about it endlessly. One of the most common misconceptions I've seen thrown around about anime is that fan service is in literally every show, and it's what ruins anime as a whole, and it takes two seconds to see just how untrue that is. But didn't you make a joke at the beginning of this video implying that fanservice is so common that it'll show up in a series that is seemingly safe for normal people to watch? Yeah, I did. It was just low-hanging fruit, and I needed a good way to start this video. While I did say that it's a staple part of the medium, there's an abundance of series out there with little to no fanservice at all, unless you count revealing clothing to be overly gratuitous fanservice, as many do with Momo from My Hero Academia. I mean, in a way it is, but taking into account that Momo literally needs her chest exposed to make items, the fanservice lends itself to the narrative in an important, non-intrusive way. Yeah, Horikoshi didn't need to draw her with those weapons of mass destruction hanging out like that. 
But it's something incredibly tame compared to what one might be led to believe with how fanservice in My Hero Academia, and other shonen for that matter, is discussed. As I was doing research for this subject, and I mean actual research, not that kind of research, I came across another video discussing fanservice, where the YouTuber in question was upset with Demon Slayer for having fanservice, and the example he used was... Even fucking Demon Slayer has some needless fanservice in the latest season. Bro, they had Nezuko with her tits out. Nezuko having the top part of her cleavage exposed. You know, a totally normal clothing style not only in anime, but in real life. And this really made me realize that the fan service that most people complain about boils down to one or two characters wearing revealing clothing. Once again, it technically is fan service. It's not as if they need it to be stylized that way, but it's such a minor thing to complain about. To me, no one else is more guilty for anime being perceived as weird sexual shit than anime fans themselves. It seems to me that those most offended by fanservice will latch onto the most minor instances of it, or will go out of their way to watch series centering around fanservice just so they can push the narrative that anime is so hard for normal people to get into. In the decade or so that I've been an anime fan, it has been painfully easy to know what series will or won't contain fanservice, either just by watching the first few episodes to understand what tone the series is setting, or, you know looking at its genre tags. I don't really understand what people mean when they say fanservice will blindside them, or come out of nowhere when a very large majority of the time it's something that's present right off the bat. After all, fanservice is what sells in Japan, so what better way to hook your audience than by introducing it at the beginning? Too many times have I seen people get upset with the fanservice in My Dress Up Darling yet continue to watch it, and it's always frustrating as the series does not hide what it's going to be about in any capacity. If you somehow couldn't tell that it was going to be a lewd series based off the first episode, the second episode hammers home just how present it will be. And if you stick around after the fact while still having a major issue with the fan service, the blame lies more on you than anything else. Just as I avoid movies with excessive gore, I think anime fans are perfectly capable of avoiding series with an abundance of fan service, seeing as they're advertised as such. Fan service is also something that's looked down upon, regardless of the context it's used in. Which is a shame, as it's disregarding one of the most unique storytelling vehicles that can only exist within something like anime. To use another video as an example, the YouTuber by the name of Schaefer Ellis made one discussing how he watched 32 anime in just one year. When he got to My Dress Up Darling, he seemingly hated everything about it and considered the edgy to be weighing down all of the other quote unquote interesting aspects of the show. I thoroughly despise with every fiber of my being. One where the mountains of fan service buried all the sweet and interesting moments it had and made me feel nothing for these characters as a result. At least the ED was cute, I guess. If you'd like to write me an essay in the comments on why I'm wrong about this show, feel free to. I mean, if you say so. I won't read it. Damn it. And once again, I take no issue with someone disliking Echi. It's not as if I'm going to show up to your house and break your legs with a baseball bat. <laughs> no, no, no. I'd only do that if you said you dislike Yudu Camp. But I do take issue with not even trying to understand why the Echi is important, and how it lends itself to the narrative in an equally important way to everything else, and instead reducing it down to incel bait. Why yes, I am trying to say there's a deeper meaning to the Echi. Oh, one second. Hello? No, mom, I don't have a porn addiction. You can stop being worried about me now. My Dress Up Darling's fan service is important because it's integral to Marin's character. She's an edgy obsessed otaku who also happens to be a very attractive and confident girl. This means that sex is a rather normal topic for her. And while sex isn't something that she partakes in actively, she has no issues with putting herself into lewd situations. At least at first until she slowly develops feelings for Gojo. The fan service is important because it's what helps bring these two characters together and considering it to be a detriment to the series is willfully ignoring that. Now, I am not going to pretend like fan service is always some elevated storytelling tactic with no ounce of pandering to the fans who will drop their life savings on Marin figures because it's not. It still intends to be sexually provocative. But because of how fan service has been utilized in anime since its inception, we're able 
to get series like My Dress of Darling and Kill a Kill that quite literally build the entire foundation of the narratives off fan service and wouldn't be able to exist otherwise. Even my last video that you should totally watch was about Punchline, a series that's about a boy who gets turned into a ghost and if he sees a girl's panties twice, the world explodes. A totally ridiculous concept, right? Well, it works solely because of how prevalent fanservice is and serves as a commentary on it, while using it to build an absurdly wacky narrative that makes it a one-of-a-kind story. My point is, while yes, obviously fanservice is used to sell merchandise, that's no secret, it has the potential to be so much more than that, yet is often overlooked by virtue of it being fanservice. I, uh, didn't know how to transition into this next part, so, uh, bear with me here. Oftentimes, fanservice is used to help set or reinforce a wacky tone within a series. Take Monogatari for example. It's often considered one of the most weird anime out there and certainly isn't something you would normally recommend to someone who is just starting out, for a few reasons. Mostly due to its avant-garde art style, non-chronological storytelling and, most importantly, its unapologetic use of fanservice. Now, depending on who you ask, you might be told that Monogatari and the series creator, Nisio Isin, has a disdain for people who are entertained by fanservice, and is basically jingling keys in your face like the dumb horny idiot you are, and while that's partially true, I do love me some fucking jingling keys, let's fucking go! It's painfully clear that Monogatari loves fanservice and wants it to be a part of its identity. It's what helps the series stand out from its peers so much, as you can have a deep introspective dialogue about two characters' mental state as they're taking a shower together, while bringing no attention to it. There's the infamous toothbrush scene that has been shown so much, it's honestly lost all its shock value, but it doubles as not only as a way to deliver fan service, but to advance the plot. What makes Monogatari so unique is how it embraces something that's been so prevalent in the medium and uses it as a sort of normal occurrence, to the point where it would almost lose its charm if Adaragi wasn't such a horny bastard. And while Monogatari uses fanservice to help set its absurd tone, something like Fire Force uses fanservice to reinforce its wacky tone, almost as another component of it. As much as people want to believe that Fire Force is some hyper-serious series that gets ruined by Tomoki's random bits of fanservice, it really isn't begging you to take every part of it seriously. I mean, for God's sake, Arthur exists and every fight he's involved in make sure you remember that he's a massive idiot, derailing the fight and plot for a moment in the same way Tomoki does. Or Princess Abana's entire characterization being that she's a simp for Shinra. Fire Force from the very beginning is telling you that it's going to be goofy. And while it's totally fine to still dislike Tamaki, it's getting a bit annoying to hear how much she ruins the show when she's simply one of many comedic characters. It's hard to say she really damages the plot in any way when her main rival is a guy who's addicted to porn and trains to fight her by reading porno mags and making sure he doesn't get turned on. Like, yeah, I get not finding the bit funny, but she's almost entirely relegated to being comic relief. There's only one singular instance of Tamaki's fanservice being invasive, in my opinion, and that's during the fight involving Rekka. While I've spent the last minute or so talking about how unserious Fire Force can be, there's still a serious narrative at hand with plenty of moments asking you to take them seriously. With this fight being among them, where it's discovered someone is essentially turning orphans into infernals, which are basically super cool badass fire monsters and... Um, hold on, I'm being told this is a bad thing? It's a super haunting moment that gets interrupted by Tamaki's Lucky Letcher activating, and it completely derails the scene. It's perhaps the only time I can even understand the issue people take with her as a character, yet somehow she's become emblematic of everything that's wrong with anime today, and it's a shame. As mentioned earlier in the video, many series make their tone and level of fanservice very known right off the bat, and Fire Force is no different. I mean, we get a shower scene involving both of the main female characters within the first 10 minutes of episode 1 before Tamaki even makes her appearance. They aren't exactly trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Yet, it feels like people intentionally grab that wool and shove it into their eye sockets. Fire Force has its serious moments, and a very large majority of the time, these serious moments are treated as such, even if Tamaki is there. It's a show with a dynamic tone, and it trusts the audience to be able to understand when it's okay to be comedic and when it's time for shit to get serious. And basically, when Tamaki is there, you know there is an 80% chance that the scene is going to be comedic. Am I saying you have to find it funny? No, of course not. I don't even find the Tamaki bits funny myself, really. 
It's just weird to me when people say she's what holds the series back or sticks out like a sore thumb when she's just one of many characters in the cast who are hyper exaggerated tropes of anime in general. Anyways, if I didn't make any sense here, I'm not trying to say that Fire Force should be free from criticism, nor is Tamaki a perfect character. Just understand what a series is setting out to do and either adjust your expectations or realize that it's maybe not for you. If you watch Blue Lock and 10 episodes in you're still moaning and groaning about its overtly edgy tone, then you have two options. Either drop the show, a perfectly fine thing to do of course, or meet it on its level. Have fun with the fact it's being edgy or at the very least understand it's a core part of the series that isn't going away. Much like how Monogatari has fanservice up the ass, yet people will still complain about it 50 episodes in as if it's somehow surprising anymore. If it sounds like I'm seething, that's because I am. I'm a whiny little piss baby who's upset with people that get offended over animated boobs in their Japanese cartoons. But I want to make it clear that I think fanservice isn't perfect. Not by a long shot. I agree that a lot of the time it's unnecessary, although I never get offended by its existence, I mostly just think to myself, that was a lame scene, and continue watching. There are valid critiques to bring up for sure, however I mostly wanted to spend this video addressing the misconception of how prevalent fanservice is in anime as a whole. There is a discussion to be had entirely about how fanservice potentially objectifies women, and I can't give too much of an insightful perspective on that seeing as I'm not a woman. I guess you could argue against it since the anime industry is filled with women, with even the most degenerate series being made by women meaning there's likely a level of acceptance of it, at least in Japan. While their gender has never been confirmed, it's believed that the mangaka of My Dress Up Darling is a woman. But I think the solution to this issue would be to simply commit to more male fanservice. There are series out there like Free, and shoujo series in general of course, but I don't think we'll have true equality until Kirito gets the Tamaki treatment and characters get a fistful of balls randomly. Truly the greatest outcome. There is another can of worms with the topic of anime characters' ages, and my stance on this has always been that it's fictional and that regardless of how you feel about the incidents taking place on screen, considering it to be pedophilia is incredibly harmful. You're allowed to be uncomfortable with it and choose not to watch series where the characters are younger, but ease off the brakes and condemning everyone for the crime of sexualizing a cartoon character to hell. Anyways, I feel like I rambled all over the place in this video, but I really just wanted to give my perspective on the whole fanservice debate. I feel so many fans are being disingenuous when they discuss it and have ultimately created a stigma about anime. I consider myself to be an avid anime watcher. I mean, I run an anime YouTube channel after all. So I'm always watching seasonals. And even looking through the anime I watched from the last season and current season, I can't recall any of them having egregious fanservice outside of the obvious examples like Onimai and Nagatoro. What I really wanted to stress in this video is that fanservice is not as prevalent as you think. If it's something you truly want to avoid, it's incredibly easy to. It hasn't infested every faucet of the medium like you might have been led to believe, and even the biggest shows out right now like Jujutsu Kaisen are completely devoid of it. It certainly exists in large quantities though, and if you choose to to engage with a show known for its fanservice or clearly will have fanservice be an ever-present aspect, have an open mind and try to understand why it exists in the first place. Or turn it off and go watch another show. Lastly, I'm okay with fanservice being criticized and if you think I'm being disingenuous with anything I said in this video, please let me know. I'd even like to know if there's any examples of a series randomly incorporating heavy fanservice when it otherwise wasn't present early on. I know this video is going to run the risk of making me seem like a degenerate coomer and that's something I was totally prepared for. I just hope I was able to explain why I personally think fanservice can be a good thing for anime sometimes. Yeah, that's all from me. I'm gonna go watch some YouTube. Oh, fuck, fuck.